Cool. So we are live. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are live inside the Shift Success uh, community group. And uh, this one is a bit different than the rest. Um, we have got someone very special who is a supporter of Shift Success. And uh, I think we became friends through social media initially. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andy Labram is the founder of Blue Light Levers, a phenomenal podcast and also a community that he has. Uh, and he helps officers and members of the emergency services transition into uh, different roles outside of those uh, jobs that they may be find themselves in. Um, so without further ado, um, ladies and gentlemen, Andy Labram, how are you doing, Andy? Yeah, great. Thanks, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. It's um, it was lovely to get an invite. And, um, you know, I'm not just saying this. I know I've said it to you sort of off record as well. But, you know, you're doing some fantastic things. And and I love what you're building and what you've done so far. And, this, you know, the success stories that you've got are phenomenal. So, um, you know, I wish you were around when, um, you know, when I was sort of early to mid service, it would have been fantastic to, you know, to have that guidance and that mentorship that, that you're giving people. So thank you very much. It is appreciated. Oh, awesome. Well, you're doing amazing things yourself, Andy. So um, um, for those who, this, there's quite a few people who know you in our side, our community, but for those sure. who don't know who you are, um, you, you as an officer yourself, what force was you from and how yeah. long was you in the force for? Yeah, sure. Um, so a long time ago now, in fact, it's, um, it was yesterday, it was 35 years ago yesterday that I actually joined the job. So I joined, um, in fact, joined the cadets, 1984. Yeah. And then uh, joined uh, joined the Met, um, uh, obviously as a PC, 1985. Um, I started off at Holloway and then um, in North London and uh, did the usual sort of stuff. I really enjoyed uniform, really enjoyed frontline work. Joined a crime squad, uh, went to CID for a short time as a, as a sort of training investigator and, and just that wasn't me. I didn't enjoy it and they didn't enjoy me specifically. So I think uh, <laughs> I failed a couple of interviews with that and I just thought this isn't for me. So I joined TSG. And won the TSG in the Met for four years and just had a fantastic time. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And I had a young family as well. So I married very young first time around. Um, young family as well. I was completely and utterly besotted with the job to the point where I had a sleeping bag in my locker and, you know, would regularly, rather than commute home, I would regularly just sort of sleep on the gym floor or go out with, with mates from work and stuff. And, um, and I think as a result of that, my my first marriage failed and then um um i we gave it a second go moved up to northamptonshire uh, which is where i'm from originally my father was a was a pc in northamptonshire and uh, so we came up here and then um gave it a second go that didn't just didn't work out but while i was up here i, I worked on shift in north ants i also um uh, i was really fortunate i was a dog handler for a while as well, which is extraordinary. Just had an amazing time as a dog handler. Thoroughly enjoyed that as firearm support dog as well. And just really enjoyed, loved that frontline work. <clears throat> and then while I was a dog handler, um, I had a call from my ex saying that um, as they had some news and uh, she'd remarried. And um, anyway, it turned out that they were heading off to Australia and um, with my daughter. Oh, wow. Um, so... And the reason I say this, it just gives a little bit of context. You know, I was really fortunate in terms of I had a fantastic career. I thoroughly enjoyed what I was doing. Um, but there were a number of times in my career when actually I was looking for other things. Um, but there was nothing around and no one around in terms of who could help me. And so there was no one like you in terms of, you know, building a side business. I tried multi-level marketing for a little while and did okay. But, you know, it wasn't. It, it just wasn't enough. And um, then that happened. And, and obviously I had to give my permission for my daughter to, to head to Australia and which I, I did after taking some legal advice. Um, and that was another period really where I sort of questioned whether I wanted to, to remain a cop. Um, but I was in the pension trap as well and I was stuck there and um, you know, I didn't really have any options. I didn't know what I could do outside of the job. It was all I'd ever done since I was a kid really. And um, as I said, there was no one about, there was nothing around to, to sort of help or, or give guidance or support. Um, I got promoted while I was on dog section and um, ended up supervising uh, some people from, from your group as well, which is fantastic, some lovely people. And that was just an absolute honor. It really was. It was, and, and you know, for me being a skipper, being a supervisor, I, I never took the inspectors. I was a sergeant for almost half my service and I just loved frontline operational managing team so i did um, response neighborhood 
Um, then I moved on to the firearms team. I was a skipper on the firearms team and a bronze commander on the firearms team, which I really enjoyed, but I was a never, never really a natural shot, but I just loved the leadership side of it. And, um, but I remarried and um, Claire had two young kids and um, the shift work was killing me, Alex. It really was. It was, I was really struggling by that stage. Mm. And I was in 20 odd years service at that stage. And, you know, my forties leading, leading firearms team, it was, it was really hard graft. And I literally felt like death all the time. I was exhausted and I was, you know, I was exhausted at work doing long hours and everything else that you do. And obviously you're first in last out. <clears throat> and, um, and it was quite hard work. And so I went to my doctor and said, look, you know, I, I, I need to change. Something has to change. And um, he basically said, well, you need to either change your job or, or you know, you've you just got to find something within the job that you can do. So actually, I was quite fortunate. It was a public order trainer and head of operational training role came up. And, um, and so I, I went for that and managed to get that, which for the last couple of years of my service, so I'm sort of about four years to go. I've been frontline up to then. Went into a training role for a couple of years and again, thoroughly enjoyed that. But then that then amalgamated with other East Midlands forces. And I just didn't really like where it was going. Mm. So I thought, well, I'm quite happy enough. I end up in custody or whatever. That's fine. And, and just do whatever I do to, to sort of see my time out. Um, and then I was offered um, a project role. Um, again, sort of right place, right time. And I've, I've been really lucky, I think, throughout my career. Um, a lot of the time, right place, right time. And a project role came up. And it was uh, for a full force amalgamation and a massive collaborative program. And they asked, because I was firearms, dogs, and public order background, well, they basically, you know what the jobs are like. They'll turn around and go, well, you'll do. You know, you've done that. You can do this. <laughs> and I'd never done any sort of project management or anything like that that I really considered to be project management. Um, and so I led a couple of work streams for that, and it landed okay. And I um, managed to, to sort of finish that just before I left. But actually looking back in hindsight, there were other things that I got involved in that were actually project management. So while I was on the firearms team, I helped, in fact, I actually led the um, schools program. We had no schools program in place to take firearms officers into, into schools to teach them about the dangers of carrying, you know, imitation guns and knives and that sort of stuff and, and the risks around that. That's a project. You know, I taught people how to de deliver that. I put it all together. I went around the UK to find best practice. And, um, you know, when I was a neighborhood skipper, I, I got some funding and set up some funding for some, some kids who are right on the cusp of, of criminal behavior um, and, you know, involved in antisocial behavior and such like. And, and we managed to get some funding from the council and match that with the police. And, you know, did some white water events with them and got the Safer Neighborhood team with them as well and you know that was projects as well and so there's one I guess what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is actually we don't think necessarily that we've got these skills and abilities and evidence and I, well I've never done project management but for, you know even that side of things you have and and that's really where this sort of started from and so I think from my last couple of years really in a project management role um I retired after 30 and, and I am one of the lucky few. Now, I do look back and I think you know, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate for having had an extraordinary career um, and, and very privileged to lead some incredible people. Um, and, you know, there's the odd numpty. There <laughs> yeah, always is, isn't there? <laughs> there always. But, you know, so and that so the first role I went for was actually a project management role. And um, it was for a um, for a change program that I didn't realize at the time. And I actually went in at a, quite a low level because I, I'd lacked that bit of self-belief and confidence. So I went in as something as basically junior project manager, junior um, junior type of role. Um, and I'd always I'd always wanted to really push myself outside of the job. I just wanted to really see what I could do and how far I could get outside of the job and you know what I could actually do. Um, but I still lacked that little bit of self-belief and confidence. And so I went in at this particular level, interviewed for it, um, got it. And then I didn't hear anything for a few weeks. And I thought, oh, no, here we go. Something's gone horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had a phone call and uh, from uh, a particular project manager who called me in and said, look, you know, we'd like to see you again. So, like, okay, second interview, no problems. You know, you're going to meet the program, program manager, no issue. So I went back in and that actually turned into a second interview. And I didn't realize at the time. But they'd seen something in me. And I think this happens a lot with cops. They'd seen something in me that they felt actually, we want you to go for the next roll up and we think you're suitable for the next, next band up. Amazing. 
So, um, so I got that. And right at the end of the interview, they said, um, you know, what salary are you after? Now, I'd, I'd never been asked that in, in sort of 30 years, 31 years or total. I've never been asked, you know, what am I looking for in terms of salary? So I, I just, I had no idea. I was completely flummoxed. And so I basically just added a bit on top of my top rate skipper's salary. And they, they snapped my hand off and I thought, oh, I wish I'd come in a bit <laughs> higher. You know, I was gutted. That I exactly. Yeah, I was gutted I hadn't come in higher. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's really sort of how that started, you know, from the job through to um, – uh, through to my initial my first role and my first cv actually was looking back was actually really quite policey but i guess they still saw something in there that, that mapped across okay and then from there i, I moved into um so basically I, I took on a program uh, or a project that had been running for five years it had seven months to go in an industry i knew nothing about i, I inherited a team of six and um i had seven months to deliver a, a, a project um and really using using the skills and experience that we picked up in the job it was just sort of you know really pr really pragmatic approach i had a fantastic team of people but they were so report focused and they were very data driven and, and rather than sort of being results driven what does it actually need to do well let's work backwards and let's see what we can do and let's get this across the line and we managed to get it across the line you know fantastic time lovely lovely people and um, then i got sort of not quite headhunted but I asked to join a team that was more around business change and organizational change. So very much more around the behaviors and cultures, which again, from a cop perspective is really, you know, we're, we're good at that sort of stuff. And we, mm -hmm. we know people and we understand people and we know what makes them tick. And I think because we'd had change, you know, we've all had change done to us for so many years. Um, and I think that really helped as well in terms of being able to understand what people are going through and what makes people tick and, and the things that really annoy people and the stuff that you can actually really help people with. Uh, so I moved into business change and organizational change. <clears throat> and again, I, I tended to get given the really challenging, so stuff that basically crashed and burned and failed miserably. And then they'd, they'd say, well, let's, let's bring this idiot in and see if he can give us a hand. And so they'd sort of drag me in and I'll get involved in. So I got involved in one particular program that was, really high profile is one of the chief execs top five and um it had failed miserably really crashed and burned and i got brought in to try and help out from from the cultural and behavioral change perspective and um and again you know as a team we managed to deliver, deliver that fantastically well i then started doing you know basic plate spinning i had four different programs that i was business change manager for and then january last year um, and all the time while I'm doing this, I've, you know, I've had numerous interviews and I've been an interviewer on many occasions, both in the job and, you know, obviously resourcing wise for uh, different organizations. And, you know, I got accepted for a consultancy and, and, you know, really, really fortunate some things I've been involved in and, and some government agencies and stuff. Um, and I was obviously picking up some knowledge and skills and alongside the skills and experience that I'd picked up in the job as well. Um, and because of the background I had, I, I thought, um, January last year, January, 2019, I thought I'm going to go freelance and just give it a go as a consultant, as a freelance, basically got one particular role and, um, very, very quickly. Uh, in fact, before I joined it, it changed into a permanent role. So that crashed and burned. And then I started to think, oh my God, you know, <laughs> have I made the right decision. Have I, you know, I went from a permi role, uh, you know, permanent job and having had secure roles my entire life, um, and then moved into a, a you know a consultancy role where you you really are sort of you know you've got a week's notice and you're out type thing, mm. but financially it's it's been incredible and and so I then got picked up for a uh, for a role rolling out uh, Microsoft Office three six five, um, and Teams, and uh, you know such like and uh, SharePoint Online and OneDrive and all those sort of things, to uh, forty thousand end users across a UK wide organisation, and um, you know so that's what I've been doing for the last twelve months. Uh, alongside some other stuff as well and um and it's just grown and grown from there really in terms of of my own knowledge and if, if someone had asked me you know a couple of years ago well, five years ago when i was leaving the job when i was absolutely terrified i had no idea what i was going to do my cv I'd, I'd written myself you know i had no help and support didn't feel as though there was anything out there if someone had said to me that in five years time you know you, you're going to be um 
doing what you're doing now and earning what you're earning now. I, I just would not have believed it. It's, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a you know, TSG, dogs, public order, you know, gun monkey, knuckle dragger, you know, that's, that's whatever <laughs> cliche you want to use, you know, but, um, but, you know, clearly there's, we have enough about us to actually be very marketable um, in, in, organizations and, and you know whether it's public sector or private sector there we have i hate using the word transferable skills and we'll come on to that yeah but we have you know we do have a lot of skills and experience that map across mm -hmm. and um, you know I, I i am really genuinely very um blessed and, and very honored and privileged to be in a position that i am um, and you yeah, have worked for it and i've you know i graduated for the first time in my life at the age of 53 uh, with a postgraduate diploma two years you know study um, I've done some Microsoft specific qualifications as well to make sure I keep on top of stuff. Um, and these are all the things that you need to do if you want to stay relevant and you need to stay, um, you know, really at the top of your game. Um, different if you're just looking at something to, to, to top up your pension, you know, you might not want to do that because, you know, the, this, you don't necessarily want to necessarily push on like I do. But I always had this thing on me, uh, sorry, this thing in me where I just wanted to really drive and push on and, and see what I could do and where I could go. And, um, you know, there's some stuff that's happened over the last couple of weeks that is just jaw dropping. That I can't, I can't really talk about at the moment, but I will do when the time's right. But so I, I am very, very blessed, very lucky. Amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, wow, awesome stuff, Andy. Um, so, so what do you do now? Tell me more about, um, you know, Blue Light Levers. You, you have, you help uh, emergency services transfer into different careers. Tell me, tell me more about that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, um, basically, it it started off because you know obviously word gets around doesn't it and if it's basically um you know people were coming up and saying that you know we, we we're really keen to move on and do new things and whether they were coming up to retirement or whether it was mid-service and um so more and more people were approaching me and i was getting referrals as well and getting other people coming up and saying that you know can you can you give us a hand you know can you look at my cv can you do this that and the other and you know i didn't charge it was all i just wanted to help people out genuinely wanted to to you know do the right thing by people because I, you know, I know what it's like. Um, and it just sort of grew from there, really. And it got to the point where it had to scale. It, I needed to to do something with it because it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, you know, some of the biggest questions, really, the you know, you get a lot of questions about how do I write a CV and you know, LinkedIn profile, those sort of those things but the biggest thing really is actually that having that belief giving people that belief that you know if someone <laughs> someone like me can do it which i know is a cliche but if someone like me can do it you know genuinely anyone can mm. um and it is a cliche and you hear it a lot but it's absolutely true and so it was you know i was helping more and more people and so i thought right, i need to really you know do something with this in terms of actually getting people more help and support because you know i work full-time i'm flat out full-time and, you know, I do have things on the side, but ultimately, um, all my eggs are sort of in one basket in terms of I'm swapping time for money. Mm -hmm. And so I am developing stuff on the side, as you know, as, as I'm sure you know, and, and there's other stuff going on as well. But, but my massive, you know, my, my, the bulk of my income is from a job. But there's more and more people coming in, and I, I wanted to give people more support um, and and scale it and so uh, i created a, a facebook group but the first thing i did with the facebook group which is which is obviously blue light levers it's a it's a private facebook group um the first thing i did was actually put in a load of cops that had successfully um transitioned to new roles mm -hmm. and i think one you know one of my i'm crap at data but one thing i'm good at is networking and leading mm -hmm. um and you know if you ask me detail or spreadsheets and stuff like that I'm, it's pointless but when it comes to actually sort of developing relationships and and helping, supporting and networking, then that's where my skills lie. And so, I think, you know, it's got all these people on a new into this Facebook group in some in incredible roles, amazing people who were so willing to help and, and, you know, different emergency service groups, but predominantly police. And then the next thing I did was was putting a load of coaches and mentors and yourself. Obviously, you're in there as well. I'm very grateful for that. Um, but, you know, I've got some extraordinary coaches, you know, some of the top coaches in the UK are in that group as well. And um, and then I filled it with, you know, more and more cops that were looking to to move and transition as well. And basically just created this amazing network where, 
you know, people can ask questions and there's people in the groups from so many different roles. You know, there's a, there's a, um, a spreadsheet in there that has, you know, seven or eight pages now of, of cops that have transitioned and, you know, members of the group can look at that and they can get some inspiration from the fact that, well, you know, I'm in that particular role and look what they're doing now. And, you know, I've helped lots of people, you know, I've literally, I, so I run a program as well called Blue Light Achievers Fast Track Program. And, you know, I've had people through that program that, you know, one an absolute superstar that with, within five weeks has, has gone from having absolutely no idea what she wanted to do to getting an amazing job within safeguarding and education. And it's, it's just an absolute privilege to be able to help people through like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky there is there's some great people in there. I manage it like you, you know, I manage that group. I'm pretty harsh. There's no second chances. Yeah. One but, crap comment and they're out. You know? I, and that's that's one thing I want to notice as well. With with there are a lot of cop Facebook groups out there. Oh, and um, I must say that yours uh, is like a beacon of positivity and you know, supportive. Whereas there's a lot of other larger groups where, you know, someone drops a comment in there and you've got a lot of people just seeing the doom and gloom in something yeah. or or taking the piss out of someone and um, isn't very helpful. So I, yeah. I like that cutthroat kind of ability yeah. that you've got to your group. And it's something we do at Shift Success as well. It's exactly great. that. Yeah, no, I'm very aware of that as well. And, and I think you've got to have that. There is so much nonsense out there. And particularly, you know, the group also has recruiters in there as well. And we've got some fantastic recruiters. And I mean, proper niche recruitment firms in there as well. And, you know, they don't post things every day, they're, you know, they're, but they watch what's going on and they contact people and I put them in touch with the recruiters if I think there's specific roles or a skill set that these people have. Um, so I don't allow any nonsense in there and there is no second chance. But when people join the group, they know that. And I don't even give people warnings. You set the comment, tone. You're gone because the group rules are there. Mm. There's a load of people that don't, if they don't click, I agree for the group rules, they don't come in. You know, so that sort of stuff as well. So it's really, really, and that is key, I think, to making sure that that group is a safe environment. It's a, it's a really good, positive place for people yeah. to go. And, and then, you know, if people want to work with me on a one-to-one -one basis, that's fantastic. Um, so we do, you know, some group programs as well. There's another one opening up later on the year. And another thing I did as well, similar to yourself as well, I think you get to the stage where <clears throat> you've got these fantastic contacts. And, and again, you want other people to hear their stories. And, you know, the podcasts are all about these people. And so I created Blue Lot Leavers podcast as well um, around about the same time that obviously you launched yours as well, Alex, which is fantastic. I really enjoy yours as well, which is brilliant. I, I enjoy yours as well, Andy. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I know it sounds a bit, but it's a bit trite, but it's actually, you know, I think it's fantastic and that we're able to do this. And, you know, the guests on the podcast are, are frontline cops who've gone on to do amazing things their charities. Uh, yesterday, I interviewed John Sutherland, you know, Command Police Commander John Sutherland, who, who um, you know, amazing interview, who um, you know, suffered a breakdown and, and left after 25 years and, and, you know, an extraordinary guy, amazing blogger. He was, an, he's, so that gets published on the 19th. He's releasing a book. My next podcast, I haven't released it to, I haven't told the group yet, but my next podcast is with a guy called um, Travis Mills. <clears throat> Travis is an, was one of only five surviving um, quadruple amputees from the Iraq and Afghanistan war. He was in the 82nd Airborne Division. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. It's okay. And he, um, you know, he talks about never give up, never quit. And the mindset stuff that you and I talk about as well. And, and, you know, the ability again, to be able to just hear these people's stories, you know, one, one guy, Simon was, was on duty working in the houses of parliament, actually in, in security in houses of parliament in a senior security role. Um, what during the terrorist attack of, of March 2017, and um, you know where uh, Keith Palmer was was brutally murdered, mm. and um, you know he tells his story. Helen Barnett, um, you know she was stabbed um, at one incident. She was um, she was shot at another, and um, she was the first female officer. Uh, she was the first mum to join um, SO19 in the Met, the armed response team in the Met. And um, she was also caught up in, in an IRA, uh, IRA explosion as well, you know, and she had an extraordinary story to tell about PTSD. And so for me, it's just an absolute privilege to be able to get these people to tell their stories. And the key thing being to give people the belief that actually they can go on to do some amazing things. Mm. You're not stuck in a job. And, and whether that's, you know, you're caught the pension trap or whether you're coming up to retirement or whether you're mid-service, 
you know, it's all about the group and the podcasts and the networking. It's all about giving people that belief that, you know, you can do it too. You're not stuck. If you need some help and support, there's plenty out there. Yeah, that's amazing. You're spot on. <clears throat> belief is such a key factor. If we don't believe it, we're never going to take action towards it. For yeah. someone who's, you know, so we have, you know, a lot of people on our database, we have thousands and um, we've kind of noticed a trend and there's about a range of cops between probably nine and 13, 14 years between there that typically reach out more and more shift success. And it's the in between of the pension. For those who are, you know, nearly halfway and got their service to go, what kind of advice would you give if they're, if they're genuinely, you know, not happy? I mean, we, I was speaking to someone the other day and, you know, she was saying that, you know, she feels like a victim at work. She's on yeah. murder squad and, um, no, she just hasn't got time for her family as much. She's bringing yeah. the shit home, her words. Um, what advice would you give to someone in, in that situation who's yeah. really not happy? Yeah, no, I think that's that. I hear that so, so often. And I've heard it referred to as well as, you know, as being in an abusive relationship as well, mm. um, which is incredible, really. And it's incredibly sad as well that that, that people feel that way. Um, Alex, you know, the reason why is massive. And what I found, and I was guilty of this as well to some extent, was that a lot of the time I was sort of comfortably uncomfortable. Mm. And, you know, there were things I was whinging and moaning about. Um, but I, I didn't really feel I could do anything about it and I felt trapped. And um, uh, Or it wasn't quite enough for me to step over the line and actually really do something about it. Mm. Um, the biggest thing I think is actually connecting with others. And if you can connect with people who've been there and done it, it is that belief and it is that, um, that connection. And you think, well, you know, so I mean, you'll have seen it in the group, you know, we, we like to post success stories in a group and let people know how others are getting on. And, and, um, and you see those within the group and, and that just breeds, you know, that continual sort of perpetual motion of actually, well, they've done it. Why can't I do it? You know? Yeah. Um, there are key steps that you need to take without a shadow of a doubt. And I think particularly with regards to um, your skill set, you know, a lot of the time we think, well, I'm a detective, so therefore I'm going to go into investigations and I'm going to work in a bank or, do, you know, and it's just, again, it's those sort of cliches and yeah. it doesn't need to be that way. You know, the first thing you need to do really is actually understand um, why you joined the job in the first place. What was it that attracted you to the job in the first place? Um, and just if I just step back for a second as well, I think this is where you and I actually work well together because I think you, sh you show people that ability to be able to, you know, with, with little investment, to be able to create amazing things alongside the job. I tend to deal with people that have, that either, you know, they want that security of a job rather than actually developing a business on the side and sometimes the uncertainty that that brings. But for me, you know, a job, I have uncertainty. I have to have insurance that covers me for, um, you know, illness and injury and, and, you know, loss of wages, that sort of stuff. If I build something on the side and develop wealth alongside it in different pillars, potentially, then, which is exactly what you're doing. So I think it's really important that, that people understand, you know, they do have different options. They can do exactly what you suggest, which I think is fantastic and actually develop something on the side work with amazing mentors and, and, you know, uh, obviously with yourself closely as well and have that, that been there and done it is fantastic. But there are that group of people that, so uh, there is that group of people that want security of a job. And that's really where I come in because I've been there and done it in terms of, um, you know, I did my 30 years, amazing career, but when I got towards the end of my service, I was incredibly stressed. I was really panicky about, what I was going to do. And I actually got alopecia. Um, and my hair started falling out in lumps with a couple of years before I actually retired. You wouldn't believe it now, this great big 1980s <laughs> blue font that I've got. Looking good. But it actually, it really did actually start falling out in lumps. And it took a few years to actually, it took just before I retired, ironically, to, uh, to grow back fully. And, you know, that was potentially because of all the shift work that I'd done and, and you know, it's, whether it's stress related or whatever, I don't know, but um, you know, that's the impact that, that policing can have on you. Mm. Um, so I think in terms of, you know, going, I haven't really answered that question particularly well. I think for someone who's desperate to leave, you know, connect, please connect, connect with me, connect with others. There's, you know, there's other people out there, but connect. And, you know, by all means, join the Blue Light Leavers Facebook group or, or send me a message through Alex or whatever it might be. 
and I can put you in touch with other people. I can help you myself and just help you to understand what you can do. But it's very much around you do need to think about why you join the job. You need to think about what it is that you really enjoy best about the job. And what do you absolutely hate? What is it that you detest about the job? Mm. And when you look at those things and you write them down and actually put pen to paper and write things down, that's when it starts to become a bit more real. And you start to get a bit more of an idea of the fact that, okay, well, if I want a new role, that's the type of thing that I want to go towards. Um, I know what I don't want to do. I don't want to do shifts. I don't want to deal with confrontation. You know, so if you've got those sort of things, but you think, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm really detail orientated. I'm fantastic. I can manage things really well. Uh, I can manage people. I'm a great leader. You know, they're the sort of things that you put to one side in your, in your pros and what you want out of a, out of a job. And then we come to transferable skills. Yeah, talk to me about the skills. So, um, you know, we, we, I think a lot of police officers do put themselves down yeah. and they, they believe they haven't got these skills. They, you know, they're almost institutionalized and these skill sets are just for the, the police and, and, and nothing else. Talk to me about, you know, if, if, you know, someone was going to come to you and they was like, you know, Andy, I don't believe I've got any skills. How would that conversation go with them? Yeah, definitely. And uh, we do get this quite regularly, as you say, and, and um, you know, I work with, a, with an extraordinary CV writer and she says to me all the time that, you know, cops come to her and they just completely undersell themselves all the time. I, I do want to tackle something that is a little bit controversial here, though, and that is this thing, um, transferable skills. Mm -hmm. um, we have skills and we have experience. There, <laughs> you, you get, people are going to hate me for this. We don't have transferable skills. Okay. So you might be a great communicator, but unless you've got some evidence to back it up that actually matches or at least maps across to a particular role that you're looking for, it will mean nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's really important that, you know, people talk about transferable skills all the time and it's just, you know, there's other people who are doing similar things to me that talk about oh, amazing transferable skills, folks, you know, you've got amazing skills. You've, match that with some incredible experience that people can barely believe the sort of stuff that we've dealt with um you have to match those to whatever role it is that you're going for that's when it becomes transferable we don't have a list of transferable skills as such i can talk you through a lot of skills yeah i can talk you through experience and so this is what i do when i'm coaching and mentoring people we do exactly this and one of the things i talk about most is you know what are they most proud of what are their achievements? You know, what is the stuff where they've actually made a difference? Um, and that's how you start to tease out these transferable skills and experience, if you get what I mean. So yeah, do employees look <clears> for <throat> that then? So what you totally. ex explain there is you know, look for experience combined with the skill. Yeah. And that's where that where the kind of the juice is, so to speak. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. That you you have to, and this is why a generic C V won't work. Mm. okay you cannot have a generic cv and we'll go into that a little bit later i'm sure yeah um i've got a uh, i've got a statistic actually that that um that i use a lot in the, in the coaching and mentoring that i do and it's it's from harvard university um from uh carnegie foundation and from stanford research institute okay so they know what they're talking about yeah yeah and it, they what they basically say is that success and i've got an exact quote here actually success in getting keeping and advancing in a job depends 85% on people skills or soft skills and only 15% on technical skills. Mm. Interesting. What you've got to do is then map those soft skills across to, um, to a particular role. And like I say, you know, that's why you can't use a generic CV. You, you have to make sure that your CV is specific. And I'm sure we'll sort of come onto that a little bit later, but yeah, you know, in terms of actual skills themselves, you know, really, you tend to have certain groups. So you might potentially have some leadership skills. And within those leadership, the, those softer skills that we've got, you know, that would be things like, um, you know, the ability to make decisions under pressure, managing teams, managing and uh, managing upwards as well. Um, you know, coaching and mentoring. Um, you know, we talk about communication skills, but we have the amazing ability to communicate with people at all levels. And, and again, you know, I sort of scribbled a few things down here that, that are on CVs and that I love that we as cops have in abundance. And if we can map these across to, to evidence, 
that relates to a particular role that we're going for, exactly as you said, that's where the magic happens. Because mm -hmm. basically what we need to do is get through the door. People need to see your CV and go, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. And then when you get through the door, that's when, you know, those first few seconds are, are so vital mm -hmm. and the impression that you make. And a lot of the stuff I do, you know, both on the course and then individual coaching as well, very much around mindset and, and um, you know, mindfulness and breathing and all those sort of things as well. So we could do a load of stuff regarding that as well. Mm. But you think of it from, you know, those softer skills and, and you know, the, the ability to, to collaborate is so, so important. So for me, the key things that I'd love to see in a CV are think from COPS, honesty and integrity. Okay, we have honesty and integrity in abundance. You know, that, that ethic, that work ethic is so important. Um, the ability to collaborate. And if you think of the sort of things that we do from, you know, whether it's working with educational establishments, social services, other departments, you know, we have to work in a collaborative fashion that we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, something called stakeholder management, which is very CV speak, very project management type speak. But again, it's something that we are so good at. You know, we manage, so we might call stakeholders are our, our customers, if you like. Mm -hmm. So our stakeholders are people that we deal with all the time. There are senior officers, there are line managers, there are partners, uh, you know, as in our colleagues. They are um, our police staff. They are members of the public. They're the villains. You know, these are, this is stakeholder management. And your ability to manage their expectations, your ability to actually deal with them is key. And again, you know, these are great little nuggets of of wording and evidence to, to slip into a CV or on your LinkedIn profile. Um, you know, that ability to communicate at all levels, so, so important, but we do that in written format. We do it non-verbally. Um, you know, we have the ability to be able to, to do it in writing. We can do it through presentations, facilitation, those sort of things as well, you know? So again, that's, that's other ways in which, you know, if you're looking at a role within education, they're the sort of things that really tick those boxes. Um, and another one I think is, is key is resilience. You know, we are so, so resilient. We have put up with, you think of, of what the average cop detention officer, whatever it might be, sees in, in, you know, in a few years is more than the vast majority of Joe public will see in their entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, shift work, working significantly under pressure, being able to manage workload, and prioritize workload under significant pressure. You know, these are all these amazing soft skills that, that we have, but that the key really is then finding some evidence for a particular role that you might like and just mapping it across. So an employer that's, sees that. Absolutely. Love that's it. exactly what it is. Love it. That's, that's great advice, everyone. Um, <clears throat> taking notes on that. So and I suppose that onto my second question, that's how you make your CV stand out if an employee, because yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing with, you know, what I found is, and as I'm sure you might have noticed this, when um, cops don't get the training or, or they go out and apply for jobs and they get disheartened or they'll get turned down by employers. Yeah. Um, you know, the reality is as well is because that having another job, believe it or not, is very competitive. Yeah. So taking Andy's advice here is going to actually separate you from the pack and give you that more increased percentage to actually get the result you want, which is that yeah. job. Yeah, there's a few things that you can do here. So from a LinkedIn perspective and a recruitment perspective. Okay, so how to really get noticed by recruiters. Um, there are a couple of things that you really need to be doing. Your LinkedIn profile shouldn't map your CV exactly. The wording of your LinkedIn profile needs to be slightly different. It's a bit more relaxed. Um, but your LinkedIn profile, you need a professional photo. Don't get it professionally done, but you need to have a decent photo of you that looks office-like, it looks professional have a good background as well. You know, so you, with LinkedIn comes with a standard gray, blue background thing that looks pretty naff. And straight away, it's apparent that you haven't put any effort into your LinkedIn profile. With your LinkedIn profile as well, there's a little bit under your, so if you go into my profile and you look underneath where it says your profile, you have your photo and just underneath there, you've got a little section that talks about, are you open to offers from recruiters? Go into that, you can put the type of roles that you're interested in and you can show that you're open to recruiters. And what that does, it 99.9% .9 hides it from the job and hides it from your contacts who are in the job. But it allows recruiters to see that you're open for offers. 
Okay, so a real big mistake, a rookie mistake that we make all the time is that that's not ticked. So we're not open for office. So recruiters don't even notice us. The other thing I'd suggest as well, and it's not just me suggesting this, so one of my guests on the podcast, um, Jamie Davies, um, amazing guy, and uh, is a recruitment consultant, ex-Wales international rugby player, phenomenal chap. Um, he talks about this as well. But actually, if you see a role that you really like, a lot of the time they'll have a point of contact on there. They'll have a name or they'll have um, you know, an email address of someone that you can contact if you have more questions. Reach out, think of a decent question and ask. And if you can phone up or if it's somewhere that's relatively close, would they be interested in meeting up for a coffee? You're really interested in finding, obviously, in current circumstances, obviously. But, <laughs> yes. um, and actually, we can talk about that as well if we need to. But, um, you know, because there still are lots of opportunities out there even now. Definitely. But reaching out to to a recruiter is that differentiates you as well because again 99 times out of 100 people don't bother um so think of a decent question and ask them that question and again when it comes through to when you've actually put your application in it's just a little trigger oh yeah they asked me a good question and it just you've got that connection there straight away um in terms of um your cv um i i would say get it professionally done um, and it's worth investing. Now, I, you know, I there are some CV writers out there. Um, I've written for some. I've written my own for other people as well. Um, but one I, I strongly recommend is someone called Charlotte Eve. And the reason I recommend Charlotte Eve is twofold, really. Um, she's written CVs for cops uh, globally. She's been a professional CV writer for over 20 years. She's a member of the Blue Light Leavers group. And she her podcast is by far the most popular podcast, episode number one on the um on the Blue Light Leavers podcast. Um, but her work, her work ethic is extraordinary. So she deals predominantly with um, a lot of cops. But what I love about Charlotte is the fact that she particularly helps people who are who have been on maybe either unemployed for a long time um, or they're coming back from maternity or paternity leave. So they've had a big gap in their careers. Um, or people who've been made redundant. She just has a, a phenomenal human work ethic first it's not about the money she has amazing connection with every she's written she's written my cv and i've been successful as a result of her she's written so many good cvs for people who have gone on to be successful um you know within the blue Lives group and she's written for all ranks you know within um you know around the globe including the chief of police for new zealand and loads of them sort of stuff as well so i would certainly consider investing in getting your cv done professionally if um if you want to do it yourself, which I did initially, because I didn't know there was such a thing really as professional CV writers. So, <laughs> so I'd give it, I thought I'd wing it and see what happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are loads of free templates out there. And again, Charlotte, she's, um, her organization is called CK Futures Limited. And she has loads of templates available. And if you say that you're from Blue Light Leavers as well, then she will add a load more freebies to you as well to, to give you as well as a result in, in a pack that she sends out to people. Um, but you can go to her website, you can download a load of templates as well, and she'll send some stuff out to you as well. She's exceptional. And there's lots of stuff, there's stuff on LinkedIn as well. But keep your CV simple. But it has to be achievement led. Okay, so use bullet points. So for example, your header itself, so it might you might term it executive profile, or you might start it or you know, um, you know, professional summary. Um that the first few seconds of your CV being read are the most important bit. So you've got to make sure that you get all the right stuff within about a third, two thirds of that front page. So you've hit the nail on the head there. So in marketing, in, in business, you know, we, it's the headline, you know, if yeah. you, if you put a piece of content out there in business, it's that headline initially that grabs our attention and just going back to dating, right? Dating when, you know, whenever that was, um, you know, it's that first attraction that's attracted to that, that person. It goes same with CVs then what you're saying. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. You've got to sell yourself, you know, mostly most people won't read your, read through your entire CV. You know, it's that first um, few seconds are really vital. So you've got to make sure that that first paragraph underneath hits all the buttons. Now it's really, really important. And I, we get this a lot and we get this in a group as well, where people are punting out the same CV for every job. Mm. Now there's something called applicant tracking system, ATS. 
And the issue is if you start applying for loads of jobs through Reed or Indeed and some of these bigger organizations, they filter out using, and, and in fact, a lot of the top 500 organizations um, in, the, in the UK use something called applicant tracking system. Mm. So if your CV doesn't match some of these key words, then you don't even, it doesn't even get seen by a human. And that's why you don't get any response when you apply for a job. And that's why you can't use one CV to fit all. You have to pick out the keywords. So one of the things I do again, you know, coaching and mentoring one-to-one is we will sit and go through word for word, the role description and the person profile within the job and map words, sometimes part sentences across into a CV within your professional experience to make sure that you're ticking the boxes and particularly within that first paragraph. Um, not quite plagiarism, but you're almost cutting and pasting stuff because yeah. if you don't have those keywords, then you won't even get through ATS to be seen by, by a human. We've, um, <clears throat> we, we recently um, hired, so we've been hired, we've been growing the company and, um, one of our, um, new, new, she might, I don't know if she's watching now, her name's Abby. And, um, we had a lot of people reach out to us to, to get this certain role within shift success. And one thing that stood about Abby is that she took the initiative to call us first before submitting the cv to get our attention and yep. i thought that was that was genius because it did get my attention and yep. it got her in and um she's doing phenomenally well so yeah so yeah yeah it, it does make such a difference and just subliminally someone has has done something different mm. um you know they've gone out of their way to make that connection and um you know again i talk about this all the time is ne- the importance of networking you know particularly with linkedin linkedin is a fantastic tool um but when all this blows over and things calm down a little bit, you know, now is a great time to connect with people via LinkedIn because people are very open to those connections. But what's really important is, is reaching out to people who may be in a particular role or working for an organization that you, um, that you think, yeah, okay, actually, I like their values. It's close to home. You know, I like the sort of work they're doing. You know, reach out and connect with them and just say, look, you know, I really like what you're doing. I would love to, I'm currently in this role. I would love to follow your career path. You know, would you be willing to, to meet me maybe for a coffee and, and, and talk it through? And you, I guess you could do that, you know, via Zoom almost now at the moment. Yeah. But, but it's actually that, that personal connection is what will stand out. Because what happens then, and again, other people talk about this on the podcast, but other, you know, what happens then is that when a role comes up, exactly is what happened to you. You'll go, yeah, Abby, I remember. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, she's brilliant. Let's bring her in. Or it might be, you might be unsuccessful on that particular role but they'll remember you because of the impression that you made and the fact that you reached out to them. And, you know, so that networking is, is so, so important. Mm. Um, And again, just going back to your CV, obviously we're talking, covering a load of stuff, but within, you know, within your CV, don't make it fancy, keep it simple because it's being read by a lot of the times being read by a a computer, use bullet points. You know, if there are certain qualifications that you can do, if you don't want to build a business on the side, but you want to go for a job or a particular career, um, look at the type of qualifications that other people in that role have got. And can you invest in yourself? Can you either do some, some you know, uh, online learning? Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of cops go towards project, or in fact, not as many as should do. Project management is a fantastic role for cops. We are very good at that. And, you know, for ticking lots and lots of boxes. And so if you think of things like Prince2, Practitioner and Foundation, you know, you can do those online and that's straight away on your CV. You've got it, you know, nice and high profile within your CV. And again, it's something that recruiters look for if, you, if you're moving towards project management and that type of thing. So whatever career, whether it's cyber, cyber security, those sort of things, you know, have a think about what courses can I do? How can I actually, um, you know, build my education based on top of you know gcse's or whatever o levels for old men like me but you know what i mean it's <laughs> you know what can you do to actually um develop and show that you're that continuing education you haven't just sat there in the job you've done something on top of it as well and you've done something to make yourself more attractive so there's a key thing there so i've got a quote mm-hmm. that i always say you know if, if you don't invest in yourself don't mm-hmm. expect anyone to invest in you and Absolutely. i think employers are looking for that um because they want to see that development they, if they're putting their time money energy yeah. into you because recruiting is expensive and if that doesn't work out for them and they're making a loss so i suppose yeah. they're looking for that investment that personal development in themselves right yeah exactly right exactly right and, and they, they want to see that you believe in yourself that you actually yeah. you think enough of yourself to spend a bit of money and 
and actually you know make yourself more attractive to recruiters yeah or employees i've got a um i've got a question this is off topic Tra- train drivers keeps coming up what, what, yeah. what, why why do why is that the a lot of people just going into trade driving roles why is that why is it very cop specific is there anything um, about that or yeah i think um so there's a couple of things here there's um train driving itself is is you know so actually really good uh, it's um you know it's it's something that um cops are able to do quite well and whether that's because they're advanced drivers and they've got that ability to you know that forward vision and and you know deal with crisis which is all part of the testing as well mm-hmm. um so it is quite a natural thing for us to get and it pays well mm. so the pay when you first start isn't great um i, I, I put some stuff in the group actually a couple of, couple of days back and the initial pay is in the 20s but once you qualify, you get it jumps up to about 56k so it's a pretty well paid job but you do have to live within 30 minutes of whatever your station is, whatever your base is. Um, and because, you know, they are so sought after, you know, it's going to be great, isn't it? You know, sitting in front of a train traveling at 120 miles an hour. It's <laughs> an amazing thing. Um, so, yeah, it is, it is incredibly popular. Um, but they, you know, if people are interested in that, then you need to sign up um, for recruitment emails from um, you know, notices from the, your nearest train operating company. And you do need to be within 30 minutes of, of wherever your station is going to be. So they, they come and go so quick. I literally advertise them on, on, um, within the Facebook group and they were gone within minutes. So, uh, you know, awesome. you've got to be really quick with it. Snap them up. Yeah. Andy, that's a, that's amazing. <clears throat> we've, uh, we've talked about, you know, your story, transferable skills, and we don't like that word, but skills, um, and also experience uh, with that. We've talked about CVs and what makes people stand out um, when for employers, um, and also um, how to get noticed, yeah, by, by recruiters. Um, is there anything else in that kind of bit of wisdom you want to give before the end? I think, um, you know, people do have options. And whether that is building that business on the side and developing something that you help people with, or if it's, if you are looking for a new role and, you know, a new life and a different way of working, you know, it's please believe that it is very doable on both sides. You can build a phenomenal business on the side, or you can find these other roles that actually, um, you know, are really meaningful and don't put you under the, the same pressure that you're under now. Um, you know, connect, connect with me. If you're not sure how to connect with me, then get in touch with Alex and, and um, you know, he'll put you in touch. But, you know, join the group as well. You're more than welcome to Blue Light Levers group. Just reach out to me as well. You know, I'm um, Andy at bluelightlevers.com if you want to email. And obviously through the Blue Light Levers Facebook group and there's a podcast as well. Um, and, you know, it is very doable. You know, ex-dogs, ex-firearms, ex-public order, you know, Loads of people have done so many fantastic things and moved on to some extraordinary careers just by being brave enough to take that first step and actually go, right, enough is enough. Let's have a look at what's out there. Let's connect with people who've been there and done it. And let's see how things develop. And it could be as little as five weeks. There's a a guy who posted in the group, I don't know if you saw Alex, was a guy who posted in the group yesterday, um, literally two weeks. He's a guy who retired from the job. He had his CV done really quickly by charlotte he and i had a conversation gave him some pointers and literally two weeks he's gone from having no idea what he wanted to do to to finding a job and you know it's a difficult time at the moment for a lot of people with with everything that's going on both you know mentally and from an employment perspective as well and you know from a cop's perspective this may not be the right time you've got some security and everything else but if you are looking there are loads of opportunities out there still particularly with things like fast moving consumer goods Within IT, you know, I've had more contact working in IT over the past couple of weeks, and I'm Mr. Popular at the moment because I'm rolling out Teams to 40,000 users. You know, we've had we've had 50% adoption in the space of three or four weeks, and I'm having people contact me pretty much on a weekly basis at the moment saying, are you interested? So there's opportunities in IT. There's opportunities, obviously, within the care sector. There's opportunities within NHS. Huge opportunities at the moment within National Crime Squad. Um, they are... Um, they are recruiting like they've never done before. And this is going to go on for the next 12 months or so. So they're on a massive recruitment drive. And don't let the 
that sort of baseline salary put you off because when you take away your additional pension costs and you take away other things that you're paying for at the moment out of your salary, I promise you that you will be there or thereabouts if you go for something that is just a few grand under what you're currently on. In fact, you could end up being considerably better off and you get much better work-life balance as well. So don't be fooled by that baseline salary in any role that you can see out there. What, you know, it's happiness though. Like what, what's, oh, the, what's the cost of happiness? If you're going to drop two grand in, in salary, but you get to spend more time with your kids or, you know, be happier, get rid of anxiety and depression due to the job, then that's the safe, you're not coming back. This is one life you've got to live. Yeah, without a doubt. That's so wise. The, um, and again, you know, I've had the absolute privilege of helping a few people who have been in that situation where they're at breaking point. And one in particular who, who first time I met, you know, was just in floods of tears and, and, she took a role that there's a few grand less than, than what she was on mm. um, as an inspector and just a phenomenal human being. And, you know, within a few months, she's got a fantastic role in project management, doing incredibly well. But her home life has changed beyond all recognition. Her stress levels, she looks different. You know, she, she, you can just see it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, she's doing extraordinarily well. But again, it's just having that, I've had enough, I need to do something about it, connect this, you know, connect with people who've been there and done it exactly what you're doing as well, Alex, you know, you've, you've been there and done it, you know, a lot of people that have as well, you've got those success stories. And that's what makes the difference. Hmm. Awesome. Andy, you've absolutely been a gentleman. You've always been a gentleman since I first met you. I know you've came to one of our events before as well. And uh, so lucky. Thank you for, for allowing me to do that. That was amazing. No, it's okay. It was an absolute pleasure. <clears throat> and uh, for anyone who wants to get in touch with Andy, please do add him as a friend on Facebook or LinkedIn or reach out to his group. Uh, it's a phenomenal positive group of helping uh, gain jobs and different careers. Um, and yeah, Andy, you know, you're an inspiration to many, I'm sure I've got a lot of comments and uh, if there's any questions in this Facebook group, I'm sure myself and Andy will go back and answer them for you. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm really, really honored. Thank you. No problem at all. Absolutely fantastic. You take care, okay? Thank you very much. See all you right. soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye.